Hey, what's going on, everyone? Welcome to another episode of About Abroad, where it's my job to introduce you to people who have built amazing lives for themselves in various foreign corners of the globe. We're talking with expats and thought leaders about moving abroad, remote work, visas, and all the fun and practical knowledge that you need to know to follow in their footsteps. If you've ever dreamed of making a life for yourself overseas, maybe working remotely or embracing long-term travel, retiring or studying abroad, or even just taking a peek inside life beyond your borders, you've landed in the right place. As we all know, modern teams require modern solutions, and a pain point for many distributed teams for many years has been related to things like company credit cards, budgeting, and expense tracking. But this has all been solved by the team over at Ramp. With Ramp, I can issue virtual or physical company credit cards for anyone on my team in just a few clicks. I can actually assign those individual cards their particular limits and rules and track expenditures seamlessly all in the Ramp system. You can assign as many cards as you'd like, pay for transactions around the world in multiple currencies and manage your budget all in one place. I really do think Ramp might be my favorite new tool to emerge in the past few years, and I have no idea how I'd work without it anymore. Create an account in minutes and get a free $500 Ramp bonus when you spend your first $1,000 via the About Abroad affiliate link in the show notes. My guest today is my good friend Mandy Franz, who you might remember was a previous guest here on About Abroad, but today the tables have turned and she will be interviewing me. This was originally recorded as a live event that she hosted a week or so ago in the Remote Workers Worldwide community, which is the largest community in the world for remote workers. She has over 125,000 people collaborating in this space, and it was a lot of fun interacting with her and the audience in this discussion, talking about things ranging from remote work to digital nomadism and living abroad. Uh, we covered a lot of what we love to talk about here on About Abroad, but in this case, Mandy is interviewing me. So she's a lot of fun to talk to. We have also linked to the previous episode that we had with her on the show. So if you're interested in learning more about Mandy, check that one out. And if you're interested in learning more about my story, then you can tune in to this one for a great discussion with Mandy. Please help me in welcoming myself to About Abroad. Uh, yeah, the, uh, let's dive in. I'd love to uh, kick off with a bio or a quick introduction of our special guest for today. So uh, Chase Warrington is the head of remote at Doist, which uh, is the remote first company behind Todoist and Twist, which collectively supports about 40 million people globally. He is one of Doist's 100 employees in more than 35 plus countries dedicated to building productivity software that promotes a more fulfilling way to work and live. And uh, I'm super excited to be hosting today's session with Chase because he's also one of the top uh, top LinkedIn voices for remote work uh, alongside myself in 2022 and also one of the remote uh, influencers on the Remote Influencer Report in 2023. Regular Forbes contributor as well. And he's also the host of the podcast About Abroad. Uh, and not, when not nerding about remote work, uh, he loves traveling with his camper van, uh, spending time in the mountains, and taking his husky pup on a jog from time to time. So super excited to talk more about that as well, about how you travel around with a camper van in Europe. So uh, welcome, Chase. And um, maybe um, yeah, you'd like to say hi to everyone and let us know where you're currently dialing, dialing in from. Yeah, thank you, Mandy. Um, super fun to be here. It's funny hearing the the bio read back to me there because... If you look over my shoulder here, you can kind of see the the husky pup that's sleeping on the bed behind me. I'm looking out at the mountains that are covered in snow and the dolomites right now. And the camper van is parked outside getting completely covered in snow. So um, I'm I'm staying true to the bio, which I'm I'm happy about. Uh, yeah, thank you for the the introduction and the um the invitation to do this and congratulations on 125,000 uh, strong in, in this group. I do recall that when I had you on about abroad, uh, you were hoping to cross the hundred thousand mark that week. We talked about it on the show and, yeah. uh, and that was just a few short months ago. So you've come a long way. So congrats. I remember that. <laughs> Thank you. It was, was it already in May last year? I think when I was working abroad in Spain, 
Andalus um, Andalusia, yeah. See, si. yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> See, <laughs> are we talking in Spanish? And that actually brings me to um, to what I wanted to do next to uh, just kick off with uh, like a fun uh, icebreaker and to learn a bit more about you, uh, which are three short dilemmas. So I'll just mention two items, and then you just need to pick one uh, on top of your head what pops up first, and maybe with a brief explanation. And the first okay. one is: Are you ready? <laughs> I think so. Yeah, this is this is high pressure stuff right off the bat. I like it. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't prepare you at all. I didn't prepare. You. <laughs> all right. So number one is Spain or Italy. Oh, I'm literally going through this battle right now. Um, if my is my wife watching, uh, <laughs> my heart is in Spain, but my curiosity is in Italy right now. I've spent oh, five years living in Spain. I'm currently exploring Italy. And, um, and, and so I'm, I'm very, ex I'm very enthusiastic about Italy at the moment. Yeah. I can imagine you're now in a Dolomites. Is that correct? That's correct. Yeah. Up in Northern Italy. Yeah. Oh, it's so beautiful. I was there a couple of years ago during COVID and it's like one of the hidden gems, I think in Italy. Incredible, incredible place. I came through here last year for the first time, uh, during the summer and I knew I had to come back in winter and experience it then. So I'm spending the winter here and a lot of people are like, you're crazy. Why would you trade like the nice comfortable Spanish, uh, winter for, for freezing cold weather. But I was, I was kind of craving that after five or six years in the, along the Mediterranean. So I'm enjoying the the change right now. It's yeah. and it's amazing. I can imagine getting spoiled, right. After a few, uh, yes. <laughs> a lot of years working remotely and working in the sun. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But it's one A and one B really. I, I love both. And, and this whole, this whole region is just incredible. Yeah. Yeah. And love it. Yes. Uh, Italy is one of the destinations where I'm like, I have to go to every year. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, not jealous at all. All right. Next one is camper van or tiny house. Oh God, these are good. Uh, <laughs> camper van is more, is more nimble and mobile. Um, and, and not too much less comfortable. Uh, I'll go camper van. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, we'll have to trade camper van and tiny house then maybe next uh, or this year. <laughs> I'm all about home exchanges. If you want to yeah. do that sort of thing. <laughs> Okay, deal. <laughs> nice. All right. Last one. Last but not least is work async or ASAP. Oh, this one's tough. Um, you should have prepared me. Uh, <laughs> no, if you, if you know anything about my, my work, you know, I'm all in on async. Um, I don't, it's not the, it's not the end all be all for a hundred percent of the way that we communicate. Um, and you know, I, I know that there's, uh, exceptions to the rule, but generally speaking, I feel like in the modern era for distributed teams, um, they have to lean hard into async and uh, as the as the cornerstone of the communication stack. So uh, yeah. async is the easy answer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And as the, um, one of the leading authorities in async, in async from a communication or asynchronous work, I think uh, that was the best uh, best answer. So <laughs> well, I might be a bit biased. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, I see we have uh, quite some more people have joined the session. So hi, everyone. If you just popped in, um, let us know in the general chat uh, where you're dialing in from today in case you haven't yet. Um, and then uh, let's just dive in, Chase. Uh, as I know, I'm sure that many of our uh, people who are watching this today are very uh, curious to learn more about everything you have uh, to share in terms of uh, remote work and uh, yeah, building connection as a distributed team, as this session mm -hmm. is all about. Um, but before diving in that, uh, I'd love to uh, learn more about you as well and how you got started into remote work. You just mentioned five years, you've been working remotely or maybe even longer, five years in Spain at least. Um, so tell us, what brought you into where you are today uh, as a remote work and how did you start your remote work journey? Yeah, sure. So I uh, I have always worked remotely um, almost entirely my, my whole career. I, I graduated from university in 2008 and made that a priority coming out of school. I just said, you know, I know I'm going to go into the business world. Um, and up until that point, I had really thought like, you know, uh, business means like business world probably means like cubicle, commute, big city, um, all things that really didn't sound attractive to me. And I guess around that time, it wasn't really like normal to find remote work, but I just sort of made that my North Star. Like, I just really think I can do I can be a better, more productive employee and a happier human outside of work if I can uh, if I can kind of control my my own destiny in that way. So um, I made that my priority. I've I've always worked remotely. The most I ever had to go into an office was one day a week for the first six months of my first job out of uh, out of university, and then after that, it's been um, pretty much 
completely remote. There was a time though, when I, when I realized that the, the remoteness was fine, but I really wanted complete location independence. And mm-hmm. that became my new North star, sort of like the, the up leveling of, mm-hmm. of remote work. And I made a career transition, took a year off, um, did some traveling and, uh, eventually found Duist. And that was almost eight years ago. Wow. And I've been at Duist ever since. And, and Duist is where I jokingly kind of say, like, I got my PhD in remote work because, um, Duist has been remote first since day one, um, for, for like 15 years now. So long before the pandemic. Um, and I really learned how to do remote at a, at a really high level. And, uh, eventually during the pandemic, you know, the, the whole remote scene sort of changed. I mean, there was suddenly a lot of new products, services, um, new companies going remote in this, in this whole world that we had been living in started changing really rapidly. And, uh, and so we decided to create the position ahead of remote to help us navigate that space and continue to be a, a leader in the remote first space. And, uh, and so that's been my job for the last several years. And it's a, uh, it's like a, a labor of love. I, I absolutely love it. Yeah. I love it. And also the title head of remote, I think you and Darren Murph, um, and, you know, <laughs> yeah. really Mary, one of the, um, yeah, uh, leading the, the way or paving the way for the future for, um, yeah, the, the title. So, uh, I'm very curious <laughs> to learn more about, yeah, what it actually entails as well. Uh, like a day in life, uh, looks like for you, but before jumping in, I'm also very curious to, you know, you come from the U S um, why did you ch- decide to uh, move from the U S to Europe? So why, why Europe? And, um, yeah, what's, uh, what uh, is that intrigues you of, uh, of destinations in Europe? Yeah. So I was, uh, I was born to a pilot and a flight attendant. They didn't meet as the pilot and flight attendant. They met when they were younger, but my parents were, were travelers and, you know, been world travelers their whole lives. Um, but when they, when they settled down and had kids, like we, we didn't do much traveling as a, uh, as a family, when I was young, I didn't, I never left the U S until I was 18. Um, and so I think just all, I think I had it baked into me from a young age though, like talks of exploration, you know, hearing about my parents, having spent time in all these different corners of the world, I knew it was something I was going to do. And as soon as I turned 18, travel became my, uh, my, my passion. It was like what I did with all my spare money, all my spare time. And that extended all the way up until, you know, through, through college into my professional life. And, uh, and then when I started really embracing location independence, and exploring what that could mean for, for taking advantage of spending longer amounts of time abroad, not just going for, you know, a summer vacation or a couple of weeks here and there, but going and spending, you know, a couple months, or in this case now a few years, um, it was just something I, I became addicted to. So for the last, uh, six years I've been living in Europe and this is my, I guess like this six year period is my like kind of third time uh, living abroad and, um, the longest one for sure, but, uh, it's just become sort of a lifestyle for me. And, it, yeah. and it's also, I should say like, not one of those things where I felt like I had needed to like get away from the U S or I didn't like the U S has nothing to do with that. I love where I come from and have lots of like close family and friends. And that's the hardest part about this lifestyle is that I miss what I had back there, but yeah. I'm just called to the exploration side of, of being abroad. So, um, yeah. that's, what's led me here. Yeah. Amazing. And I, if I remember correctly, you, uh, obtained your citizenship in Spain, in uh, Spain last year as well, after five years. Correct? Yeah. Yeah. It's called, uh, it's called permanent residency. It's one step below. I went from being like a temporary, you have like a tourist level visa, a temporary residency visa, a permanent residency visa, which is what I have now. And then the next step is citizenship. The big difference between the two is basically voting and a passport. So, yeah. um, but I'm allowed to live and work here as a, as anybody else that's, that's from here. So for my yeah. purposes, it's pretty much the same thing. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. What well, uh, having a European passport is always, I think, uh, you know, gives you, gives you the passport into the whole Europe and, um, uh, yeah, uh, in many yeah. different this year it's uh, sort of lots of opportunities to explore more uh, countries in Europe um yeah, yeah. so uh, yeah, and, what, and what also is- Mandy I think it's something that's interesting about it is like it's not it's also for me it started out as a lot about travel and it still is a lot about that but also I meet so many you probably too like in your long term travels and spending a lot of time in other places like remote work has enabled me to live this dream but also to open up other opportunities for me and my family 
Um, mm. and like, I'm, you know, I'm fortunate I'm coming from a country where maybe that's not a hundred percent necessary right now, but I don't know what the future holds. Like having a second passport, um, is, is very valuable. And for people coming from a lot of corners of the world, um, it's not just like a nice to have, it's like a must have. Uh, and, yeah. and so I think there's something really powerful about that connected to remote work that probably doesn't get enough, you know, airtime, but it's, uh, it's, it's really important. And as you go through this, like immigration process, like I'm an immigrant now, and I've had to go sit in the visa offices next yeah. to people who like really have to be there. And, uh, and you see the doors that it's open. So I think there's something really cool there. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And I think, uh, that's something really important to mention and, and like maybe the flip side or the, um, yeah, it's also related to building connection. It's also a connection to your family. Right. And that's one of the advantages I think, uh, of remote work is being able to spend time with your family, whether that's abroad in Europe, like uh, maybe you're uh, yourself yeah. or for me now I'm back in the Netherlands, uh, spent uh, quality time with family members, uh, back, uh, back home during, uh, difficult times. So, uh, yeah, I think uh, that's also uh, something very, uh, important to note. Um, Same. I see um, uh, already uh, quite a few people asking a few questions in the chat. So thank you for that. Um, so let us know if you have anything specific you'd like us to cover, any topics or any specific questions for Chase, please drop them in the chat and we'll uh, aim to answer as many as possible at the end. Um, so uh, thanks for uh, for uh, being interactive uh, and um, yeah, showing up. Um, but uh, yeah, let's dive in uh, maybe also into a bit more uh, the practical stuff. So Chase, I'd love to know more about your role as the head of remote, and I'm sure many uh, many is in here as well. So could you maybe draw us a picture of what does a day in the life look like as the head of remote at Doist? Yeah, sure. It's a, um, well, as you said, it's not like a, a very standard position at a lot of different companies. Um, there are, you know, various titles and roles out there that somewhat connect to basically leading the remote, uh, the remote operations and infrastructure of a company. But, um, yeah, that it's, it's fairly new. It's not something you'll find at a lot of different places. And the one thing that I've found is I've talked to everybody else that's in a similar role is that they, um, there, there's not a lot of consistency between <laughs> these jobs. Like we all have very different job descriptions. They're all centered of course, around like making sure that the team is operating as well as it possibly can in a distributed environment, but, um, it's not, uh, it's, it's very uncommon to find a whole lot of commonalities between them. So that's been kind of interesting mm. at do the way that we described this was, um, we want to make sure that we stay at the forefront of the, of being a remote first company. And we have this tagline that we use that we want to do everything at a world-class level. And so doing remote at a world-class level is, is a big part of the DNA of the company. So I spend a lot of time um, thinking about that and getting to, you know, talk with other experts like yourself, uh, and, and people at other companies and, and learning from them, feeling out what they're doing, finding the holes in our infrastructure and, and up leveling that. So that can range from very boring things like our company handbook and documentation to really fun things. Like, uh, we do really awesome retreats all around the world and I get to plan and coordinate those. And so anything that falls like uh, basically off the the spectrum of like, what is the core that we're doing day to day and how can we elevate that and do it better considering the fact that we're distributed across every time zone in 35 different countries um, that falls to me to work on. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. And, you know, you mentioned, so 100, uh, 100 plus employees now across 35 different uh, countries. How was that? I mean, you joined do it, do is seven, eight years ago, you, uh, you say how, how many employees were there back then and how did you yeah, go through that transition into managing a bigger global team around the world and, um, yeah, maybe any challenges that, uh, uh that you had encountered in along the way to connect all of those employees. Yeah. So we, when I hired, when I was hired, I think we were around 40 employees somewhere in that range. And, um, and now we're around a hundred and, and to be honest, like our goal isn't to really be like a, a huge company in terms of personnel. Um, we just want to be like more productive and keep our head count as low as possible, but our output as high as possible. So, um, fortunately with like technology and, and, uh, and the way we're a productivity company by design. So I feel like confident mm -hmm. we can do that. Um, and, and so, you know, along the way we've, we've learned a ton. I mean, I think like a lot of startups, you, uh, you start out just kind of doing things. You're sort of building the airplane as you fly it. It's, you know, our, our company was literally founded by our, our CEO and founder who just wanted to like build a to-do list app for himself. 
And then like, suddenly he was like, oh, I need an employee to help with customer support tickets. And, oh, I need someone to help with this and that. And then all of a sudden he, he had a team, you know? And, and so the, that's a lot, that's the, the genesis of a lot of companies over time, those, those processes that you sort of copied and pasted together, uh, start to fall apart as you scale. And, um, and so seeing the transition going from, you know, 30 employees, 40 employees, 50 up to a hundred, you see a lot of those things break down and you have to break them down completely and then rebuild them for a, for a bigger team. And so that's been really interesting to see. Uh, it's, it's also been a lot of fun to like to rebuild that. And one of the things that I get to work on, you know, one of the things that we're talking about specifically today is like, how do you keep people connected? Um, and this is one of the big knocks on remote work is like, oh, you can't be a connected team, a cohesive team. You can't build real relationships. You're basically like, you know, robots behind a screen and, uh, people never leave their bedrooms. They're just sad and lonely and, we like we can tr- completely try to buck that uh, that narrative because we we have a very robust social life and people that have true friendships at work and and we work really hard at that to make work uh, feel connected and fun um, yeah. along with being very productive. So that's something I get to work on and I I really enjoy. Yeah, yeah, I love that in your recent post as well where you shared about building um the importance of building a people first culture. Yeah. Um, and I think that building connection is super important. That's, um, yeah, I think that's great that that's, um, yeah, that you're responsible for that as well as the head of remote. Do you have any like specific, like, um, practical tips or lessons learned, um, that, uh, you could share with our viewers today on how to build connection, maybe some activities or rituals that you have at, uh, Duist? Yeah, definitely. So, so we kind of place, uh, like social connection into, into three buckets. Um, one is like synchronous and in person. Those are the retreats that we do at, at Duist. We do two retreats per year. Um, three, if you're on the, on the leadership team for, cause we do a leadership retreat, but, um, generally speaking, we bring everyone together in one place, uh, for what we call Duist connect. It's our like all hands meeting this past year. We actually did it in, in Italy in Tuscany, um, but we pick a new destination every year and we spend a week together in an incredible place. And, and that goes a long way. We also do what we call mini retreats, which is each individual team gets together. We have mm-hmm. those coming up in a, in a few weeks. Um, and so the, the big takeaway there is like a lot of people think that remote or remote first means remote only. And, and I don't think that's a successful way to go about building a remote first team. You have to bake, uh, in-person time into, mm-hmm the, uh, into the infrastructure of your remote first setup. So yeah. that's one. Another bucket is, uh, sync synchronous and virtual, which we have like a whole social calendar. Uh, actually today we just held like a really awesome interactive session with an outside speaker, um, that kind of brought people together and facilitated something over zoom. Um, and so we, we have a lot of activities like that pretty much every couple of weeks, you can join some sort of session with your teammates that's outside the confines of work and purely, you know, social and collaborative. Um, and so we do a lot of things like that. And then we have asynchronous, uh, and virtual, we have a lot of activities that are happening at any given time where people are playing asynchronous games, or there's prompts to make you, you know, start conversations and, and connect with each other on subjects outside of work and, and spaces that are, you know, designed specifically for people to connect, um, beyond just, you know, talking about work stuff. So the key with all three of these things is like intentionally creating them for remote teams and, and making sure that you're actively like as a leader in the company. And as the, you know, if you're the, if you're the CEO of a company or whatever, speaking that into reality, like making it a core part of work, not this like extra burden that you're putting on top of people. And yeah. I think that's something we do really well. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. And especially, you know, not the, it's not remote only. Um, so uh, yeah. with this bucket, I think, you know, connecting in person is not just about building connections virtually, um, but also building more in-person connections. Uh, and it, yeah, it's, I think it's one of the myths or misconceptions of remote work or remote first companies that you only work remotely and only from your laptop. Um, and even yeah. as a remote worker without a team, I I'm, I mean, I don't work for a big company or that's maybe a smaller, like a smaller company like yourself. Um, so you, as a remote worker or digital nomad, you also actively have to, you know, go find those in-person connections or activities um, to also yeah get that uh, feeling of uh, a sense of belonging, I think, which you also create within the company. 
So um, definitely. I think that. Yeah. It, it, yeah. Oh, sorry. Well, one thing to to add to that too is like we we also think very strategically through the fact that. Um, how you could like the main way that we connect is, is actually work. Like it's okay to admit that we're, you know, we're like teammates, not family. And, um, the work is actually the thing that binds us together. So investing a lot of intentionality in how can we make sure that people are getting like really interesting connections in their day-to-day work? Um, cause it can be very easy to just, in fact, we went down this road for a long time. Like we set up a lot of workflows that were very isolating. Like you just kind of worked on your own and then shared your work later. And there was no like collaboration um, or very little of it. And and we rethought that completely and said like, no, that's not really fun. You know, people want to work with different people. They want to solve hard problems. They want to, you know, get together and collaborate uh, synchronously, you know, in a virtual sense and then asynchronously. Um, And so just thinking through like how we can create those connections and we created a whole project management system around this. So, Mm -hmm. you know, it's specifically designed for working distributed and across many time zones. And, yeah. and, uh, I think it's that, that level of intentionality that differentiates it. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. And I think you also, even if you zoom into the retreats planning, which I love by the way, as, as part of your uh, job, I like to organizing retreats and, you know, I think fun activities and really building that connection beyond work is super important. And you've shared on LinkedIn, a couple of tips and strategies on how you, uh, plan those retreats intentionally as well to make sure that there's time for bonding personally rather than only yeah. profession- professionally. Um, could you share your thought process when planning those retreats? So maybe there are some people here, you know, that want to plan a retreat for their team or maybe for themselves as a workation, as I like to call it. Uh, but do you have any tips uh, in terms of maybe destinations, but also uh, what kind of activities you would keep in mind um, when planning those uh, kind of um, yeah in-person connection and bonding activities? Yeah, definitely. It's it's one of the most fun parts of the uh, of the job. It's it's also like one of the most stressful, oddly, but it's uh, but it's the probably <laughs> the part that I enjoy uh, the most. And and so um, yeah, I mean, I think there's a couple things like. The first is, is going very much so down to the basics is like a lot of people skip over thinking about why they're even doing the retreat. It's just like a, oh, it's a thing we have to do now. I can't tell you how many leaders of teams or companies that I've spoken with over the last couple of years that say something along the lines of like, yeah, my, you know, I was told I have to start hosting a retreat. I don't know anything about this. Like, I'm just, you know, I just know we have to go do it and I have a budget and that's where I'm starting from. And and then it's just like, got to find a hotel, got to find a couple restaurants to go to or whatever. And there's like no, in, there's no level of like intentionality put behind it as to what does this even mean? What's the point of this gathering? So, so getting down to some basics and starting from what is the actual purpose and then crafting everything around that is, is super important. In our case, what we decided, we've been doing retreats since, I think since 2014 or 2015, I can't remember the year exactly, but for a while now, um, One thing that we found is that like, there's a very strong inclination to want to take that time that you're together and like maximize it in terms of packing the schedule with a lot of activities, um, and like getting something productive. Like there's something in our head that says we're spending all this money and all this time and all these resources on bringing people together. Like we better get something really productive, like tangibly productive out of it. And, and that can happen. I'm not saying it doesn't, but I think we have a tendency to over-index on that mm-hmm. and put too much emphasis on, on trying to create something when in reality, like in our case, we're, we're built to be a distributed team that functions really well, asynchronously working from our homes and the places that we're comfortable. Um, when we come together and work in person, I, I, we often find like the productivity just isn't there. Like we don't, we don't actually get a huge return on our investment in that regard. So what we did is we just flipped it upside down and said like, these things aren't really about getting a lot of work done. This is the, the collective eight or 10 days a year that we get together to actually like connect and build bonds that will pay dividends throughout the year. So yeah. we focused everything on that and actually came up with a formula. We're like, it's called the 20, 30, 50 rule, 20% work, 30% activities, and 50% free time for serendipitous conversation and things like that. So, um, I would just, just think through like, what's the right formula for you and what's the, what's the goal of the gathering? Yeah. 
I uh, love that formula. 2020, uh, 60, 2020, 60, 20, that's right. Uh, 2030, 50. 20, 30, 50, sorry. <laughs> I was yeah. thinking something <laughs> not right there. But uh, yeah, I love that to make it really uh, tangible. And um, yeah, I think, um, yeah, really being intentional uh, around the goal of the gathering is super important as well, even if it's virtual or uh, or in person, but especially if it's uh, eight or 10 days where people come uh, to another destination. <laughs> so yeah. uh, that brings me uh, to another question I was really curious about based on your, um, yeah, you've been working all around uh, Europe by yourself in your camper van with your husky dog and uh but also uh for retreats uh with uh Duis. so and i actually today i saw a post where someone tagged me um with the top 10, 10 destinations in europe to work remotely and mm. weirdly the netherlands was mentioned three times <laughs> <laughs> and uh i was like this can't be correct so there was a discussion going on if um if the list uh, actually represents the best remote work destinations in europe uh, because I think the Netherlands is uh, is uh, fine. It's uh, and actually Rotterdam. That's where uh, I uh, I am from. I'm not sure if you've ever been to Rotterdam, Chase. I haven't been to Rotterdam. No, I've been to the Netherlands quite a bit, but I keep missing Rotterdam. And one of yeah. my best friends recently moved there and is begging me to come visit. So it's on the <laughs> list. Think, yeah, we talked about this. I think during the podcast as well. Yeah. <laughs> We'll be right back to the show after a quick break for a note from our sponsor. This episode is brought to you in partnership with my friends over at Lamont & Co. If you're planning a retreat, off-site, or group gathering of any kind this year, I highly suggest tapping into their extensive knowledge and experience to help you find the best possible venue for your event. I work with Kim, who has become my trusted advisor when it comes to planning any event around the world, and she's literally saved me hundreds of hours of work and has located venues I never would have found on my own. She even provides me with budget breakdowns and cost estimates for each each location I'm interested in and negotiates contract terms on my behalf all for free. If it sounds too good to be true, I thought the exact same thing at first, but I can assure you this is the real deal. Lamont is paid by the venues, not by you. So there's no cost, risk or obligation here. So do yourself a favor and contact Lamont via the link in the show notes when you're planning your next group retreat, offsite or gathering. Before we dive back into the rest of the interview, I have a small favor to ask of the audience. If you are enjoying this episode and getting some value out of it, then please please follow these very simple instructions. Step one, pick up your phone. I'll give you a second. Step two, leave a five-star review for About Abroad. That's it. <laughs> That's all I'm asking. It takes about two seconds. Of course, it is completely free to you and it is the best possible way to support myself, the show, and everyone working on About Abroad behind the scenes. The funny thing is, is that there are thousands of people tuning in to this show every single week, but we are very likely to only get a few reviews by industry standards and reviews are the most impactful way that you can show support for the show. So if you have the time, please do so. And either way, I hope you enjoy the rest of this episode. Based on your experience, what are maybe, yeah, what is the top three best des destinations in, in Europe to uh, work remotely from either personally or with your family or with your uh, team? Yeah, it's a great question. Like, uh, it, I think it, you know, obviously depends a lot on what you're going for, what stage of life you're in um, and, and you know, what your uh, the seasonalities and things like that. Like I'm, I'm here in cold, snowy Italian Dolomites right now, which for a lot of people probably does not sound super appealing, but it's exactly what I want in, in this moment. Um, so generally speaking, I think like some of the, the highlights, like, uh, I know you're a big fan of Portugal as am I. And, and I think very like specifically what Gonzalo Hall and his team have done down in Madeira is incredible. Um, mm -hmm. I had the chance to visit there last year and, uh, and just love the community that's forming around digital nomads and remote work. And obviously the year round amazing weather and scenery, um, it's, uh, that's, that's pretty tough to beat. Um, yeah. another one that I think is like up and coming on this list is, is generally speaking, just I'll say Greece, um, which is a big, oh. you know, location, but I think their digital nomad visa is one of like low key, one of the best digital nomad visas out there, mm. um, for a couple reasons. One, the, the process to get it, um, the, the fact that you get like a, a, a residency permit just by applying, so you can apply for it there. You can get, immediately get a permit just to, to stay beyond your 90 days just by being there, just by applying. And then yeah. also like they don't make it complicated with paying taxes there or anything like that. Like you just, you get the nomad visa, you're there and Greece has so much to offer. We, we I just spent uh, three months there earlier this year and like 
there's a big community forming around remote work and digital nomadism. And yeah. there's also, um, you have that visa and then you have a lot going on beyond just the islands. Like we, we just tend to think about the islands, but there's mountains and snow and big cities aside from Athens and lots of stuff going on. So I think that yeah. one should be on the list. I don't know if it's on your radar as much. Well, what do you think? <laughs> it's a coincidence because I'm actually going to Greece next month. <laughs> so uh, okay. <laughs> I'm, um, and it's something I haven't shared yet in the community, but I'm happy to share it here for uh, those who are live and for you as well to hear for the first time. But uh, we're actually um, a part of an exciting project with the AU, the Euro European Union, uh, to uh, research remote work um, and the impact of remote work in terms of productivity and um, yeah, also urban, wow. like where it uh, what remote workers need in terms of living, etc., and uh, work-life balance as well in uh, different destinations in Europe. And uh, Greece will be uh, part of that. And that uh, is actually where the headquarters is of this uh, whole project. It will be a three-year project. So it's a quite exciting uh, time. And um, yeah, next month will be the kickoff in uh, Thessaloniki in Greece. I've never been there. <laughs> so, That's uh, wild. That's what I was going to say. I was going to say this is like the, the at the heart of what I'm, when I'm describing what I'm thinking of there with Greece, uh, I think Thessaloniki is like at the the top of that list because everybody right. there in Greece is talking about it as like the up and coming destination. Like if you don't want all the hecticness of Athens, but you want to have a great place with a lot of community and culture yeah. and art and stuff yeah. going on, then it's like, you know, it's an incredible destination. So I'm happy, uh, happy to hear nice. this. <laughs> I actually I, I haven't heard of Thessaloniki um, before, um, before going to this uh, work trip. Uh, the only place I've been in Greece is uh, Chersonisos. <laughs> and I don't dare to say this because I know there's Dutch people inside this uh, inside this chat today, Romain. <laughs> you probably know Chersonisos <laughs> as well. It's like the, the Dutch play, the place where all the Dutch people go when they're 18 and they can go on the first uh, vacation <laughs> without parents. Yes. I love it. Yes. I love it. I see people in the chat uh, plus wanting that. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And uh, thanks for the nice uh, kind words, Andrea and uh, Romain as well, about the project. So we're excited to uh, share more about that as well in the next uh, few weeks. But um, yeah, we uh, have uh, 20 or 50 minutes or so left and we have quite a few questions as well that were popping inside the chat. So if you still have any questions for Chase that you'd like us to cover, please uh, answer them in the in the chat or ask them in the chat and then we'll get through that in a couple of minutes. But before diving into those, um, Chase, I also would like to um, talk a bit more about your amazing podcast that I was part of uh, last year about abroad, for which you've interviewed uh, many remote work advocates and leaders and digital nomads. I think you've had this podcast for uh, like pre-pandemic. Uh, is that correct? Yeah, I believe so. I'm actually, as you were saying that, I'm trying to remember when I started it. Uh, somewhere, somewhere around there. Yeah, we're several, we're we're couple several years into it at this point, and uh, it's hmm. it started out as just a little side project. I was interested in podcasting and thought, oh, this would be a fun way to, you know, just learn a new skill or whatever. And uh, it's grown into a a side business and um, and yeah. a lot of fun, and allowed me to connect with you know amazing people like yourself. So. I, uh, yeah. I absolutely love it. Nice. Well, I'm uh, curious to uh, hear as well. You've been, you know, this, it's you've interviewed so many people, and I'm sure you've heard so many interesting insights uh, from uh, people all around the world. So, do you have maybe one or two podcast episodes that you really recommend, and uh, and why? Aside from yours. Aside from mine. <laughs> I want <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> to say the same. That's too easy. Um, <laughs> Yeah, it's that's so so tough to answer. I mean, I've had the, the very cool thing that has been fun um, about producing this podcast is that uh, like it started out originally like, oh, I know some people in this space. I'm just going to interview them and learn about some of the cool things they're doing. Like I mentioned Gonzalo Hall, um, you know, and, and the, if anybody's familiar with his project down in Madeira, creating the world's first digital nomad village and um, and just like that was happening at the same time. So like one of my first episodes was bringing him on as he was doing that. And as like CNN's also covering it and BBC and travel and leisure. And, um, and I remember that episode, like kind of blowing up and just thinking like, you know, I thought like maybe 10 people would listen to one of these episodes and there's like, you know, hundreds and, um, and eventually thousands. And you, you're just like, wow. wow, this is, this is really interesting to, to see that people actually care about this stuff and that it's, it's kind of happening at the same, at the same time. Um, so I have to say that was kind of like a, a very interesting, not just a great conversation with a good friend, but also like, 
uh, interesting to see the impact that these conversations were having on, on people at, at a pretty important time. Yeah. Um, but then the, the other side of it is like, you know, there's people, we talk a lot about like remote work and digital nomads, but there's like so many people that fall outside the spectrum of like what we, the stereotypical person that we typically would think of in that regard. So like talking with, you know, families who have made this, this move or who are living like, you know, very alternative lifestyles or some of the people who are like behind the mechanics of the digital nomad visas and like create helping create them, um, you know, remote work CEOs at companies who are like building products and services that are servicing remote, uh, workers and digital nomads. Like all of these things are kind of, we try to balance the show between all of these different, uh, areas. And, and so, you know, talking to people across those different, uh, facets of work has been really, really fun. Yeah. Super cool. I, uh, I will link, uh, 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 you're about to broad podcast inside our um, uh, community, the uh, Inner Circle. We have um, the VIP community, Remote Workers Worldwide Inner Circle, where we have a more external platform ex- uh, outside of our LinkedIn environment uh, to really provide more uh, valuable uh, resources and features. So uh, if you uh, want, I can uh, highlight a couple of those that you uh, recommend. And uh, so our members uh, are in there can uh, easily go there and uh, listen back. But otherwise, as well, we can um, yeah, link to your uh, to your podcast uh, to Spotify. I think it is, right? So, yeah, uh, yeah, it's available on every any platform that you listen to podcasts on should be available on uh, Spotify and Apple Podcasts are the two most popular platforms that people listen from. Yeah. But um, yeah, if you're into like digital nomad visas, if you're into like exploring expat life or or remote work, remote work's one subject. Um, but any of those, you know, just kind of like with a tagline is life beyond your borders, uh, anything like that, then that's the kind of stuff we try to cover. We release one new episode every week. Yeah. Amazing. Oh, perfect. Well, thank you so much, Chase, for sharing uh, all of that insights. And I know time flies by very fast, so we have uh, 15 more minutes left. And uh, I noted down a few questions from our uh, members today, and I see we uh, have a few members uh, adding more questions. So again, if you have any questions, feel free to uh, ask them in the chat. But uh, let's uh, just kick, um, uh, go through the chat and uh, answer uh, our members' questions today. So um, maybe we can get started with uh, Ariel, because I see Ariel here posted uh, at the, uh, the last list at the bottom. Um, but do you think more startups are embracing or reversing the remote work trends? Uh, I think that's an interesting, uh, interesting one. So it depends the, on how you define remote work trend, um, if you're and and where your starting point is. Um, so, like on a chronological scale. So basically, like if you look at where we are right now, um, you're you're probably at around thirty percent, forty percent more days worked remotely than we were pre-pandemic. But if you look on a chart, like at the spike that we had during remote, then it would look like we were reversing that trend, right? So it depends on if we're looking three, four years ago, starting from there and continuing the trend up, or um, or if we're starting from the pandemic. All data seems to show that we'll continue to see more days worked remotely than, uh, than you know, 1%, 2% more per year. So it should continue to trend upwards. Um, yeah. And then it also depends on if you're looking at like remote first work. Uh, most most companies are reversing that tried remote first are reverting back to some form of hybrid work. So they have some form of like in-person requirement on a semi-regular basis. Um, and so a lot of teams that did try remote first, like tried doing what Duist is doing right now, decided that didn't work for them and, and went back. So that number is shrinking. Yeah. Interesting. And I think, yeah, like maybe for startups who are just starting out, uh, you know, it's more easy to, um, to intentionally get started with a remote first model, especially when you follow Chase, cause he shares amazing insights around, um, mm-hmm. building a distributed team. Um, but it's more difficult, I think for our bigger corporations, like, uh, like the tech the giants yep. to, uh, stay yep. remote. I see your, uh, husky dog left, uh, left his corner <laughs> in the bed. Yes. Yeah. He's shaking back there. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. All right. Um, so I'll just, uh, go now from the top of the list. Um, so maybe, um, Romain and Victor, I have asked uh, your, ad- the advantages and disadvantages of remote work. Could you share that both, I think in ger- general, in terms of working remotely, but also in terms of building that connection on a personal and, uh, and a team level. Do you, uh, yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I think some of the, um, some of the advantages are, you know, ones that we all 
No, probably. Right. Like, you know, access to worldwide talent, um, or at least a, a larger talent pool. Um, if you expand from, you know, a zip code or a postal code or a state for province or whatever, and you start going further around the world, then you've got more opportunities to hire great people. Um, secondly, I think you give people the power of control over their workday. So it's really important for us at Duis, for example, like we want people to work when it makes most sense for them, when they have the most creativity, when it works best for their family dynamics, um, all of those things. So we're, we're giving people the power to, to craft their perfect workday and working in a remote first setting uh, ensures that we have to do that. Like we're, we're spread out all across the world. So we're kind of forced to do that. And then, you know, on the, on the flip side of that, I think you, you know, you do certainly have some challenges. I mean, we have, we have people that are, um, you know, that don't really do well in a remote first setting. They crave the office, they crave the structure, the routine, um, and, and they want those social connections on a daily basis. And, and that's totally understandable. Um, we, we understand that there's a trade-off there. And, you know, one of the things that really suffers when you're working in an async first environment is, um, is the speed of execution. Like things do move slower. Um, we have to structure our workload so that people have lots of stuff to work on simultaneously because at any given time, one thing may be sort of blocked by, by others. And it's our job to unblock those things as quickly as possible. But we, we recognize like the speed of execution is, is a bit slower. So you have to tweak the operating system to, to adapt to that. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I think those are, those are a few of them. There's, there's pros and cons to every decision. Remote isn't perfect. Um, it, it comes with challenges. There's also legal and compliance challenges you have to come, uh, you have to face at some point. And, and so, you know, there's, there, there's a lot to to think about. It's not as easy as just like flipping a switch and choosing one or the other. It's it's building everything that you yeah. do around one system or the other. Yeah, exactly. And I think um, uh, when talking about challenges, um, a question of Scott about taxation, I think is also one of the uh, challenges that every remote company or remote employee has. Yeah. Um, Scott asks, how does taxation work when you work from different locations? Is there anything you could share from your experience there? Yeah, totally. So generally speaking, I mean, every country has their own taxation rules. Um, but generally speaking, you become a tax resident of a country when you spend more than 183 days there. Um, that number can change, but that's sort of like a general baseline rule. Um, and and then so there's there's a lot that from an organizational standpoint that comes into this when you start thinking about how do you pay your digital nomads and when do they create a permanent establishment in a in a country. And how long are they allowed to work, you know, in another country and you keep paying them back in the home country? Um, so these are these are real challenges. I, unfortunately, the the space around employers of record um, EORs is is really developing fastly and addressing a lot of these needs and opening it up to where you can actually legally hire people in foreign countries, pay them properly, pay the taxes um, all of that. But it's it's very complex and and the governments are trying to keep up, honestly, like they're they're having to adapt and governments don't move quickly, generally speaking. So especially uh, in Portugal. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So uh, it's 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 a messy subject for sure. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, you mentioned the employee of records. I think that's um yeah, important one for those who don't know in the in the chats. Um, you know, companies like Remote or Deal. Um, Oyster, I think, is another one. Um, those are very interesting companies to look at, and uh, I think some, many, of them, or like few of them at least, they also work um, with uh, contractors or freelancers. So that's yes. also if you uh, if you work for yourself, also something interesting to look into. So deal or remote. Um, all right, then um, a question by Andrea, which I think was very interesting. Um, about we talked about your role as head of remote. Andrea asks. What other roles specifically connected to remote work do you see emerging in the near future? If well, I, I got to uh, I got to sit on a a panel of a bunch of other head of remote or director of remote work or you know titles similar and and you know our focus of work was all pretty similar in that regard and we all got asked a question like this like where does this role go what do you see as the future of this and we we all kind of thought the same thing that like hopefully this this position. And um, just the way we think about work sort of fades away. And I, and I think that's, you know, kind of happening because remote work is really just work now in the, 
in the knowledge worker space. I kind of hate that phrase knowledge worker, but I don't know mm-hmm. a better one to use. You, you know what I mean? But like, um, in the, in the world that we live in, like, this is just sort of the way we work. We're all working in some form of a distributed manner. So, um, I think what you'll see is a lot of these positions will become like workplace design, um, virtual workplace design. Um, it'll be folded up into, uh, a part of the, uh, the people ops team or something like that. But I think the, the general concept will be there that someone needs to be focused on how we operate as a digital first company. And, and, you know, depending on if you're a team that's transitioning to a more digital first space from a more physical present space, or if you're, you know, someone that's just like a team that's just emerging and growing completely organically from a more virtual first space, somebody focused on that as a core part of how they uh, function every day is going to be important. And I think will continue to be a thing. Yeah. Yeah, definitely interesting workplace. Um, yeah, and that preparation op- operation people operations is going to be a uh, big this year, I think. Yeah. Um, all right. The, there's a question by Yanis Lava uh, about the culture of Duist. So we talked about uh, yeah how you engage your employees at Duist, um, and that also ties back to the culture, I think. Um, but maybe uh, yeah, could you share a bit more about how would you describe the culture at uh, Duist? Yeah. Um, so I, I've mentioned a couple things today that like I'll resurrect that I think all kind of tie together. Like I mentioned the the mantra of doing things at a world class level. I mentioned async, not ASAP. Yeah. <laughs> um, I mentioned we mentioned people first. Uh, we talked a lot about the investment that we make in building human connection. We talked about the fact that we're like a productivity company first. Um, we're also a bootstrapped company, so we don't have any VC funding. Um, which means we don't really have to like focus on other people's initiatives. We focus on like what's important to us as a, as a company. Um, and, and so I think all those things kind of, you know, if you like could physically ball them up together, it would, it would tell you a lot about what, uh, what do looks like from the inside out. I mean, we really genuinely do care a lot about our people. Um, we, we put them first. Uh, a lot of companies will say things like, you know, our people are our greatest asset, but I feel really confident that we, we take that to heart and we, uh, and we, you know, we live that every day. We make trade-offs constantly that might affect the bottom line somewhat negatively, but they're, they're for the better part or for the betterment of our, our teammates. We provide a ton of time off, uh, 52 days a year combined. Um, we have, uh, you know, by, by depending on where you're coming from, we, we have perks and benefits Mm -hmm. that, uh, that would rival, um, you know, pretty much any company out there, I think just all centered around, like if our people show up as the best versions of themselves, then, then we're going to do an awesome job. And as long as we, uh, have the right leadership in place and and put people in a position to succeed, then, then we can. And, and a huge part of that is how we operate as a remote first team. Like we, we really want people to live where they want to live, work from when and where they want to, uh, work from and, uh, and come to work refreshed and excited about what they're doing. Um, so yeah. everything that we talked about today kind of goes yeah. into that, but, but yeah. That, yeah, that's truly who we are. Yeah. That sounds amazing. And I'm sure that many of you who are watching today are thinking like, okay, this sounds incredible, but maybe, uh, you currently don't ha- work for such a company yet, or maybe you want to uh, work uh, more internationally, like, uh, Julian asked and we had Ayla inside the chat and, um, uh, they're asking if you have any tips? So maybe, because I know we're on time, we have three more minutes, but if you would have <laughs> one tip to share with someone to get started, to uh, figure out how to get into remote work and work globally, uh, what would that be? I, I can do like a couple real, real fast. Uh, so <laughs> one is when you apply, don't say that the reason that you want to come work for them is because they're you want to work remotely. Um, that is not serving us at all. And keep in mind that you are applying for a job where you need to show value. So that doesn't add value. Every everybody that applies to work to to work at Duist wants to work remotely. Um, and then the other thing that I'll mention is get really good at writing. Um, a lot of people are awesome at expressing themselves verbally, but less so at expressing themselves thoroughly and succinctly in a in a, in a really positive manner. Um, so. That's how we work every day. And so it's important for you to show up as that when you make your your application. Um, I've seen some incredibly talented people drop incredible resumes with five pages of information that it's like, this would never fly where we work. So 
Um, yeah. Get really good at that. <laughs> yeah, I love that. And yes, that's uh, such a good point that, you know, it's not everybody wants to work remote. So that's not how you stand out. <laughs> As yeah. I always say, you know, uh, with background in personal branding and LinkedIn, stand out from the crowds and, you know, everybody who wants to work remotely who applies for Doist, I imagine, or companies like Doist. So uh, make sure to add value. Great tip. Thanks for yeah. sharing, uh, Chase, and sharing all of your valuable insights today. I really enjoyed talking with you and learning more about your background story and uh, also your husky dog who is uh, patiently waiting for you in the back to... Uh... Not so patiently, but uh, that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Patient. Thanks for letting him join. Yeah. He uh, he would have been on the other side of the door, door just barking at me to come in and uh, you bring him in and then he'll, he'll bark to get out. So it's just how it works. <laughs> Thanks for tuning in today from wherever you are in the world. Once again, I'm Chase, and this has been another episode of About Abroad. For those of you wondering how you can best support the show, I have made it super simple for you. Just go over to the show notes of the episode that you just finished listening to and click on one of the two following links. Aboutabroad.com slash newsletter to get our monthly newsletter. No spam, guaranteed. Or ratethispodcast.com slash aboutabroad, where you can quickly and easily leave a review for the show. It's not just important to me, it also helps more wanderers just like you find us. Finally, don't forget to subscribe on your podcast platform of choice, and we will see you again next week. Thanks again. Hasta luego, amigos.